There we go. Right, you should be able to hear us now. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, Salary Sacrifice Q&A with uh, myself, Thomas Fitzgerald. We're broadcasting from Vehicle Consulting uh, in Sunny Start Pot. I'm Head of Marketing and we're joined with Mike Cottrell, who is our Salary Sacrifice expert. So <laughs> <laughs> We'll get there in the end. We'll get there in the end. A few techno issues, but uh, techno notice. Um, so we are going to be taking your questions all about salary sacrifice. So if you do have any questions about salary sacrifice today, then do feel free to comment them in the comment section just down below and we will see them on our screen and we will answer them for you live in this video. If you're watching the recording of this, still comment your questions below and we will answer the questions for you. We'll drop your uh, message and answer the question. Uh, another thing to add is if you want to book a chat with Mike here, uh, have a one-on-one -on -one chat, talk through uh, Slow Sacrifice in general, ask him any questions. You can do that by scanning this QR code here. It takes you through to a booking site and you can choose a date and time and have a one-on-one -on -one call with Mike to discuss all things salary sacrifice. So as I said, any time throughout this uh, live, we'll be here for the next hour-ish, uh, depending on how many questions. Comment your questions and we will answer them for you. I've got some questions ready to go. We're going to keep it kind of podcast style and just have a chat about salary sacrifice. So let's kick things off. So Mike, um, just on a high level, we're talking to managing directors today. From their point of view, what is salary sacrifice? Yeah, no problem at all. So salary sacrifice is it's an employer benefit, which is offered out to employees. Essentially, what they can do is it allows employees to forego a gross element of their salary um, obviously avoiding income tax slash insurance and by doing that they get themselves into an electric vehicle now the reason why this is such a popular perk is one it's significantly cheaper than doing it with an employee's growth or sorry net salary so it's cheaper than them getting paid getting taxed and going sourcing the vehicle from the dealership essentially they're using their gross salary to source a vehicle as opposed to their net salary mm -hmm. now from a managing director there's loads of reasons why this might be a benefit obviously we've listed probably the key one um, it's massively cheaper for your employees which is a great perk in itself but in terms of that, obviously there's NIC savings, which can come attracted to it. Um, you can reduce your carbon footprint for your business, um, employee staff retention. Mm -hmm. um, there's loads of great reasons why a company would want to offer this perk. Yeah, okay. But the big one is that it saves money for your well, car payments, doesn't it? Ultimately, like you say, when you're offering an employer benefit, oh, sorry, employee benefit, the, the main thing you want to do really is look after your employees and what's better than saving them money. Yeah, exactly. That's going to keep you employees happy and that's what increases that uh, staff retention isn't it exactly. so i want to talk uh before we kind of get into the details on it i mean i find the best way to demonstrate how it actually works is with an example so me and you came up with an example are uh, specifically for managing directors comparing what managing directors typically go for in a car which is often well it's basically it's a bmw um, five series M Sport. Yeah, it? exactly. Like you say it's hard to gauge every every like I say every director's vehicle, but like I say a common vehicle which is ordered by directors is sort of a premium brand saloon vehicle, or executive saloons like the BMW five series, Mercedes E class. Along them lines, it's quite common that they're ordered under what well, normal business contract hire agreement and done through the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of directors get something like that. It's a petrol. Well, in this example, it's BMW 5 Series M Sport 520i, in case you're wondering. Um, a lot of people get that through a, a business contract hire through the business. Is that right? Yeah, exactly right. Like, I mean, salary sacrifice is a business contract hire agreement as well. It's just how it's deducted through payroll. But yeah, historically, most companies, company cars, for example, are just a business contract hire agreement, um, which then obviously attracts benefit in kind as well. Okay, so I just wanted to compare that to getting one of the most popular directors' cars through salary sacrifice, which is a full electric Porsche Taycan. Yeah. Now, obviously, some people have reservations about uh, going full electric, which is why we've done this example, because it's probably going to change your mind when you see the figures. So, um, I mean, the Porsche Taycan is one of the most popular directors' cars, isn't it? For Yeah, so for, for any directors which have switched over from sort of the petrol diesel variants into full electric, it tends to be the route they go down first. Um, like you say, most most directors or, or employees at companies look at just the physical rental of a vehicle, and it's it, it's easy to do because the problem is all these sites online, all these prices, they advertise just the physical rental, but they never actually go into discussing the back end costs, which are attributed to it. So you say electric vehicles are more expensive. For example, this Porsche Taycan, I think, is about twenty to grand more expensive than the BMW. So naturally, it's going to be more expensive to lease. But like I say, once you actually look into it. 
on a higher level, um, you actually see that th there's a massive benefit to having vehicles like that full electric. Yeah, so there's basically, you've got to take into account two things, as you kind of alluded to, when you get in your car three business, which is the rental of the car. Yes. And the bit that everyone forgets is the benefit in kind tax. Would you just explain what that is. Yeah, so obviously any vehicle which is sourced through a company, obviously it's a company car, it's given to you. There's an element of personal use for it if it's a company car, in which case it would attract benefit in kind because it is a benefit from the company. Okay, and that vastly varies on, well, it's 2% of the value of the car on electric cars, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's correct. So any electric vehicle at the minute, it's fixed at 2%, so that doesn't matter whether you're in a 100 gram Porsche Taycan, a 30 grand, 25 grand Vauxhall Corsa, it's 2% fixed for the duration of the contract. Um, and that's not changing until 2025, and then it's going up a percent thereafter until it gets to 2028, and that's then it ends up at 5%. Now, to put that into perspective, at the minute, most petrol and diesels are sort of in the realm of 30 to 38 percent of a benefit in kind. So you can see just how scalable that is, especially if you're going into the higher tax brackets, which I'm sure most directors are. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the 40, 45 percent, it only compounds and makes it much worse as well. Mm -hmm. So it's the combination of the benefit in kind plus the rental is the key thing. But the benefit in kind is much more expensive. Let's I mean, let's just get into this example. So we're going to compare that BMW 5 Series. Uh, it's 520i M Sport, comparing it to a Porsche Taycan. Just compare the values. The value of the Porsche Taycan is 79 grand. Uh, the BMW is 50, just a, a shade under 52 grand. But the key part is when you compare the rental. So let's just look at the BMW. So the, the rental for the entire year is 8,038, but the BIK is 6,433. So when you combine those two, that's 14,447. Exactly, yeah. Probably just to clarify as well, we did this as an example of someone that's a 40% taxpayer. Yes, yes, sorry, I should have said that. This is someone uh, earning 80 grand. We set up both these examples yeah. of 36 months and 10,000 miles a year. Yeah. So if you took that BMW, your net take home after you've paid for your car, going into your bank account over the course of the year is 47,000. And 70 pounds now compare that to the porsche taycan which has a value of 79 grand which so it's a 27 thousand pound more expensive car the bik is much cheaper it's 528 pounds per year compared to the 6438 of the bmw bmw so that's where you see the difference so after you've paid for your rental on your porsche plus the bik doing it through salary salary sacrifice your net take home is £51,082. So comparing that to the 47 with the BMW, you're saving 40,000, uh, sorry, £4,000 a year. Yeah. So and it's, it's, it's a lot. It's exactly correct. I mean, we and we've done it here, sort of, it's not even a light for light vehicle, for example. Um, we've done it on a more expensive car just to show that even though you're looking at these vehicles, because if you actually looked at it sort of closely, you'd probably see the, the business contract higher rental for the Porsche Taycan, I think is, 900 pound but the actual bmw one's only 600 mm -hmm. so if you're looking at it initially you think well the bmw is much cheaper but like you say when you sort of add all the back-end costs and the savings from income tax mm -hmm. etc and then added on the bik the total saving going full electric is is, is massive and like you say obviously if we picked a, a, a light for light vehicle perhaps like a tesla model y or a tesla model 3 which has a similar p11 d value to the 5 series the savings would go from four thousand probably closer to we'll be probably looking at closer to eight double double yeah. savings so it's it is massive exactly i just find it crazy that you can for the same price as a bmw 5 series you can be driving around in a porsche yeah. 27 grand more and you're saving four thousand pounds a year and it's not like four thousand pounds and there's going to be taxes on it that's four thousand pounds in your bank account yeah and like you said there's a reason for it i mean if, if you look on the road now historically before Porsche sort of dipped the toe into the electric vehicle market. You didn't see many Porsches on the road. But what you would see is you see quite a lot of Porsche takings on the road now, and there is a reason for that. And mm. and this here is, is is exactly the reason why. Yeah, exactly. And they are amazing cars as well. If you've ever been in one, they're they're so nice. They're ridiculously quick, yeah, um, beautiful cars. So like, it, it's it's basically. I mean, obviously, don't get me wrong on the savings, but it is making vehicles which most people have the perception were never attainable. To actually make not not just be attainable, but actually make in more financial sense than than the be like I could be in the V five series. So it's actually well, I'm getting a much better car. I'd, I'd love to drive one of them, and it's cheaper. Mm. So it's 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 a no brainer really when you actually go into it. Yeah, well, this is the thing. It, it is a no brainer, but people have this reservation about electric cars. But 
when you see that kind of saving that can be made, uh, uh, absolutely, surely right. that would change your mind. I'm, I'm sure it changes most people's minds. Yes, exactly, exactly. But so we've obviously given that demonstration of the, the Porsche versus the BMW i series because we're talking to managing directors this morning. It's kind of managing director style cars. Um, but this isn't just for the directors, is it? This is a perk that you offer to all your staff. Exactly. Like you say, this is a scheme which can be implemented across your entire staff. Like you say, ultimately, it, it works more, I say, it, it works for everyone, this scheme. Obviously, the higher you earn, if you fall into 40, 45%, it just adds even more because you're deducting it from your gross salary. So if you're deducting it from your salary, which comes under the 40, 45%, you're just saving more in income tax. Well, this perk, should be offered to your employee, entire employee database just because it's saving the money it's giving all your employees an opportunity to use their gross salary to source a vehicle and like you say at the at the moment um it's a really important factor to a lot of people that like you say you're making an employee's salary go further so you're not necessarily giving them a pay rise but you're giving them the opportunity to let their salary go further which is one of the main points of an employee benefit yeah exactly so yeah you are just essentially it's kind of like a pay rise it, it, like in that portion bmw example it's like having a port four grand pay rise exactly so i mean obviously employees can't opt into it all at once like i say if we launched a scheme obviously some people are in financial contracts already let's like say some of them might have committed to a three four year personal financial contract so they might still have a year two years left of it but you're giving them the opportunity to when they can renew it to save the money essentially so mm -hmm. why why wouldn't you do it okay now i every managing director who's watching this is thinking okay don't mind getting a car myself bit scared of opening it up to the rest of the staff what happens if one of them leaves am i isn't business going to be stuck with that car no like you say it's, it's, it's a really common question obviously from a direct level you take your vehicle you know your circumstances chances are directors very rarely leave the business so you know where you're fixed in a position however i completely understand the last thing you don't want is open up to your employee staff, 50 employees take a vehicle and then 30 of them leave within the year and you're thinking, I've got all these vehicles, which obviously it is a business contract hire agreement. You are you are the company which is paying for it. What do I do? Now, the answer to that is I think, a product called early termination protection. It's a bolt onto the scheme. And essentially what it does is it covers you um, for any staff departures, maternity, paternity, long-term sickness. It's basically the eventuality where an employee leaves the company for whatever reason, you just hand the vehicle back with no cost to you. Now, it's, it's a bolt-on scheme to the product. Um, the cost generally is is borne by the, by the employee, so they generally take on the cost. But what I would say is most employees are happy to take on the cost for it because it gives them protection as well. So you're looking at it from without thinking, I need protection for my company. But an employee's thinking, well, I don't want to take a vehicle. And if circumstances mean I have to leave, I'm paying the pain to sort of dispose of it myself so you'll find this product is it, it's, it's not an, an easy sell everyone wants it it benefits everyone and then obviously certain certain companies use the nic savings which i'm sure we'll touch on in a moment to actually offset some of the costs so in in actual fact it's not actually costing anyone money and it's well, costing it neutral well yeah let's talk about that the cost of the whole scheme and the fact that it can work out to be or often does work out to be cost cost neutral yeah. How does that work? So, so, so like I say, one of the main benefits of this perks on the reason why it's so popular in companies is that it can be driven and be cost neutral. Um, so every employee which opts into this scheme, obviously they tend to grow a, a sort of a, a general gross deduction tends to sort of be anywhere between five to eight hundred pounds. So when they were opts into salary sacrifice, he's given up that proportion of salary, which means you as an employer would pay less national insurance on their wage because on paper they're earning less. So the savings tend to be sort of anywhere between seventy to one hundred pounds per month per employee. Um, now, to give you an idea, the early termination insurance, one of the one of the providers we use is a, is a premium which adds on sort of 8.14% on the rental. So if you had a vehicle which was £500, 8.14% is cheaper than the money you're saving in IC. So you can actually pass that back on mm -hmm. and you can run it as a cost neutral perk. Like you say, there's loads of different ways we can structure it. But ultimately, if, if you as an employer thinking, I want to set this up, but I don't want to pay any money to set up, which is absolutely fair, mm -hmm. um, it can be run cost neutral as well. Okay, and what about things like car insurance? There's, how is that set up? So vehicle insurance, there's, there's two different ways what we do. Obviously, depending on the size of company, we like to speak to the employer first because sometimes they have a large fleet anyway and they have a fleet policy, in which case they might want to keep it in-house, their insurance, and add it onto their fleet policy. It can be done. It's not a problem at all. We can build our system around that. Alternatively, we do also off, offer another bolt onto the Salsat product, which is insurance. Now that covers, obviously, yourself, um, any partner which lives in the same premises um 
And as well as that, it covers business use as well, which is probably a key one. So if any of your staff members are using the vehicle for any business use, it is insured for that as well. And that's the same same thing as the early termination protection. That's just a bolt on to the scheme and the cost. Obviously, you can subsidise it with the NIC savings or the cost can be borne by the employee. Like you say, all of these things that are being bolted on all come under the same gross deduction. So there is income tax savings and IC savings on that as well because right. it's getting deducted as one whole payment from your, from your employee. Okay, that's excellent. I've just noticed we've got our first question. Uh, what happens if an employee leaves or decides to just hand the car back? I think we've just covered <laughs> that. So perfect yeah, timing. Perfect, perfect, perfect timing. timing. So uh, uh, if you're just joining us, we are doing a Q&A all about uh, car salary sacrifice. If you have any questions, do comment them in the comment section down below. You can see where someone else has commented there. If you want to book a call with Mike, our salary sacrifice expert, scan this QR code on your phone. It takes you to a booking link and you can book a call. Or if you want, this is hosted by Mike. You'll see Mike Cottrell hosting this event. Just send him a connection request and you can drop him a message. So uh, let's continue chatting about uh, the whole scheme. What? Let's talk about the kind of cars you can get through the scheme. So obviously there's a few different types of cars on the road this, uh, at the moment. You've got your internal combustion engine cars, hybrids, uh, where there's a few different varieties of that, and then you've got full electric. Yeah. Can you get all of them through salary sacrifice? So in theory, yes, you can. Um, However, there's a reason we're talking about EV vehicles specifically, and that's because the most savings, and you'll see most of the teams are geared towards electric vehicles because ultimately that's where the most savings are made because the benefit in kind is, is so low. So when an employee is deducting their gross salary, um, obviously they're making income tax and NIC, say, or sorry, income tax and income tax savings. And then on top of that, they are paying benefit in kind because the vehicle does attract BIK. So you might be saving £300 per month in income tax, but he's paying back sort of 40, 50 pound in BIK tax, for BIK example, is that ben benefiting, benefiting kind right. tax. So he's still massively saving. Now, the next one we look at is plug-in hybrids. This can absolutely be done on the scheme. They tend to have a benefiting kind tax range of anywhere sort of between, the, the most common sort of between eight and 16%. There is sort of ones that fall out of that, but most commonly it's 16%. So there is still a benefit and it's still much cheaper than going doing it getting taxed with it, getting taxed on your gross salary and then doing it with your net salary at a dealership. Um, there's still savings to be made. There's just not quite as much. And then with petrol and oh, you know, just petrol, diesel, as we mentioned before, benefiting kinds tend to be sort of in the realm of 30 to 38%. It's just not financially viable because although, yes, you are making, you are deducting a gross salary, your salary, you are saving 300, 250 pound in income tax. You're paying most of that back, if not all of it back in benefiting kind tax. So, the, the, the scheme doesn't work so in theory yes you could but it's just i would i wouldn't advise it yeah exactly well just going back to that bmw example that on the petrol bmw the bik percentage was 31 percent yeah so 31 percent of 52 grand and you're paying that over the course of your, your lease aren't you yeah, exactly. if you compare that to your um porsche taycan at two percent it's an 80 grand car um <laughs> the BIK per year is £528. I like you say, that only compounds. Well. I mean, I think that them figures will be based on a 40% tax pay, for example. But if you then move into a 45% tax pay, your benefit in kind contribution goes up a slight bit more as well. So from 20 to 40 is quite big as well. So if anyone's falling over that gap, it become, it, it starts getting expensive with petrol and diesel vehicles. What, what would you say to people who are, you know, they're looking at the scheme, but they're thinking, well, I'm not quite ready for full electric yet. I'm thinking hybrid. What What would you say to them? Do you think it's worthwhile getting a hybrid or would you go full electric? I mean, ultimately, I'd like to have a conversation and understand their, their driving needs, how many miles they're doing, where they're based is probably a key one. Like you say, I, I understand and I'd love everyone to be into electric vehicles. There's a massive benefit to it and it's saving everyone money. However, I do understand certain people might not have the capability to do it. They might be right up in the north of england they might be in a flat where they can't have a, a home charging port and they might be doing twenty thousand miles a year in which case I, I could understand why they don't need a plug-in hybrid however people that are doing maybe five thousand miles a year um have the capability to have a charger installed um and just are reluctant because i mean it, it's the unknown isn't it if people haven't driven electric car they wouldn't understand the driving profiles and the problem is is you see all the doom and gloom on the new cc all the of it, oh, I, I couldn't charge my vehicle. I've run out of range. You never see all the good, the, the, the positive behind it. You only see the negative in the news. So what I would like to do is sort of have a conversation, understand their driving profiles, and then I would suggest what I think is best for them. Like you say, I understand electric can't be run by everyone, but I think more 
I think more of the population can run one than what they think is what I would say. Okay. So, I mean, if you live in a kind of urban or semi-urban area of the country, I mean, like yourself, yeah. you drive electric. Don't I you? do, yes. So, I mean, how was it when you first went from electric to petrol? Oh, sorry, petrol to electric. So I, I, I probably was, I've done like the, the full progression. So I've gone from petrol diesel then to plug-in hybrid. Okay. And then I went into and plug-in hybrid at the time. I mean, they had a really low benefit in kind of a few years back. Um, but what I probably would say is obviously my, I had a Golf GTE back then. I think it had a 30 mile electric range and a plug-in hybrid. Yeah. But I quickly realized, I mean, my commute to work is 32 miles, so literally just over that period. But when I was driving it, I thought, well, I'm getting nearly to and from work every day with this plug-in hybrid. And I'm saving it because it's at that time electric. Obviously, this was before electric spikes and, and all that. It was really cheap to charge. And I'm thinking, well, if I just move over to full electric, obviously, this only had a 30-mile range. My car now has a 320-mile range for, for reference. I thought if I could just get a car which does sort of 150 miles more than this then i could potentially get to and from work all week without with, with one charge mm. so i had a good sort of integration to it so I had, I had sort of the middle ground where i was running electric but then i always had the backup whereas if i ran out of electric i had the petrol engine most people now are just making the jump from petrol diesel to electric which i understand can be can be daunting but what i would say is and from my experience is i think people vastly overestimate the the mileage they do Mm -hmm. um like I say all these electric vehicles if you've got a charging point installed at home all of them if you plug it in late at night like say if you've got a cheaper charging tariff between sort of 11 to 6 you can set your car up so you can plug it in six o'clock at night when you go home you can set it to start charging at 11 pay less for it to charge in the night and they can all charge over they, they can all have a full charge overnight so it's really easy as well like I say it's, it's hard for me to say any negatives because I found my experience really easy um, obviously, I appreciate some people might not have the same route, but what I would say is I think, like I say, once I've had a conversation with you, um, I think people do vastly overestimate the mileage they do, and, yeah. and they, they worry probably a bit too much. Yeah, and if you do have those worries, just f think about the saving you're getting. Yeah, exactly. That, that will I mean, that, that, that always softens the blow when it goes, well, I'm, I'm unsure I'm moving across. Well, yeah, but you're also saving. On all of this as well, you're getting a better car, you're getting a more expensive car, and you're saving five grand a year doing it and then they go oh, actually I quite quite like the idea of it yeah exactly <laughs> exactly if you are watching this and you want to get um some prices on a car to see how much you could save um i would book a call with mike scan this qr code here or you can send mike a connection request and he will drop your message on linkedin uh more than happy to give you price examples because that is the best way to demonstrate it so if you choose a car we'll need to know your salary um but obviously we'll keep that private but um we can work out how much you can save so that is yeah. something that helps demonstrate absolutely well. if anyone needs examples obviously all it needs is probably your existing agreement of what you're currently doing what you're looking towards and i can, I can happily sort of stay in the right direction i can put it right. and say ultimately we want to educate people into this we don't want people opting into the scheme we don't understand it we want to educate everyone mm -hmm. and make and make them see the benefit of it because mm -hmm. once they've seen the benefit then it tends to all move a lot a lot smoother so if you've, you have got any questions about that like you say just just get in touch Excellent. Okay, let's. Uh, we usually save this bit to the end, the car talk. But yes. let's. Let's. It's the fun part. Isn't it is. It, it is so. the fun part. It's the, bit, it's the bit that everyone seems to like. <laughs> exactly. Let's move it forward. Let's talk <laughs> about cars. Um, mainly, managing directors watching this today. Yes. What are the most popular salary sacrifice cars for a managing? Yes. So obviously, director? we want to touch on the Porsche Taker. We've already yeah. put, put a segment for that and talked about it. So obviously, that yes. is probably the most common direct mm -hmm. level ordered car. However, there is a lot now, and what I would say is. The ranges are getting better as well. Um, I mean, the Porsche Taken, it has got a good range. It tends to fall sort of in between sort of the 300 miles at the minute, but most people order the Porsche Taken for the performance element of it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a Porsche yeah. and, and the performance element. However, probably the common ones, BMW iX, really big SUV. Yeah. Um, got a, like I say, for a big car, got a range of, sort of upwards of 350 miles. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a long range. We've got one of those on test. We we, we have got one on test. Way. I think there's the M60. That's sort of another thing which we might switch on as well. Everyone thinks by the electric vehicles, oh, it's just historically electric vehicles have always been like um Nissan no. Oops and small Nissan Leafs and small electric vehicles, which were weren't very powerful than just sort of yeah they, they weren't great to look at and obviously that's flipped on its head now yeah um electric vehicles still have the sort of like the bmw m3 m4 m5 like the performance levels bmw didn't just scrap them when they moved over to when they're moving over these vehicles to electric they still make performance electric vehicles so i think the one that we've got out there is i think it's 650 brake horsepower yeah it's crazy it's, and it, it's quick 
Um, <laughs> so to give you to give you an idea, like I say it's not stopping, but BMW iX. Um, we get a lot of Audi Q8 e-tron, same large SUV style vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, but like you say, what you would see like Mercedes EQE, which is an E-class size, the EQS, which is large, but their the EQS now has got a range of I think it's about 420 miles. Mm -hmm. So some of these some of these cars that you say you think oh, I'm worrying about how far I'm going to get with them. It's not going to be long before these cars are doing more per tank, per tank or per, per, charge. per charge, yeah, yeah. yeah. Than, what, than what the normal petrol and combustion engines were doing. It is moving along so quickly. Um, like you say, I mean, you've always got your Teslas probably direct levels. I mean, but if you like me, like they're really well priced. Um, if you're bothered about your high end stuff and you just want an electric car that works, being both the Teslas, the Tesla Model 3, Tesla Model Y, um, they're always really popular. Um, obviously, Tesla Model 3 has just brought out the facelift model which mm -hmm. has changed it doesn't look like it's changed when you look at it but actually when you're looking into it it has changed quite a lot that's coming out next year so you can order them now um it's, it's moving along really quickly and like you say everyone now with the i get the the electric bands moved from 2030 back to 2035 but that doesn't mean that the manufacturers are going to adhere to that date um, manufacturers are governed now a certain percentage of their vehicles here have to be sourced full electric to avoid taxes so they're not going to slow down with this. Um, I think it was announced, don't quote me, I think it was announced the other day that Jaguar is planning to become a full electric brand. And I think that was by 2028. And that's just not a long time away now. No, exactly. Um, Land Rover, for example, they only make plug-in hybrids at the minute. But if you if you go on the news, Jaguar have just committed to building a massive new site in England. I don't know where it is. So, don't, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to guess. Um, but it's all for electric vehicles. So all these manufacturers are gearing up for it. And like you say, although it's been pushed back to 2035 in the government's eyes, I think what you'll see is the 2030 deadline will still be adhered by most manufacturers because it financially suits them as well. Well, the thing I was thinking about as well in terms of when to get your first electric car, well, obviously it's moving in that direction. It makes complete sense to just take advantage of this salary sacrifice scheme now while you've got your 2% BIK and you can get that saving use that money to install an electric charger in your home if you haven't got one or in your business why wait until that kind of low bik is is potentially yeah. not going to exist anymore before you get an electric no car. You, you're absolutely right i mean this scheme is always going to be cheap like i say although yes in 2028 the bik it will be five percent but it's not like it's just electric which is moving up in bik plug-in hybrids are also going up and so are petrol and diesel so you can see how it's just getting worse and worse so it's still going to be the cheapest route to market um like you say you go back four or five years the benefit in kind of electric vehicles was zero so it doesn't matter what electric car you had it was zero so it's it, it is progressively moving but as as anything will do um but it is still by far and away the cheapest way to do it. it's like you say it was, it was if you go back a few years obviously plug-in hybrids had a really low benefit in kind so people jumped on that while it was massively cheap and now it's not so much cheaper and then they move into electric so what i would say is it, you may as well jump into it sooner because that's where the savings are being made and if you can if you obviously you as an employer wants to do it because you might financially want to save on your money but offer it out to your employees sooner because you're saving them money sooner um, and like you say things might ease off in a few years but we are like saying money is quite tight for a lot of people at the moment due to obviously interest rate changes and everything like that so why wouldn't you offer this perk now where you're probably seeing the biggest benefit from it yeah, exactly. Or an employee seeing the biggest benefit of it, I should say. 100%. Well, just talking about employees, we talked about the director's cars, but obviously it is a perk that's designed to be for all your staff. Let's talk about the kind of popular employees' cars. Um, you know, yeah. you know, your average Joe, what no, kind of car are they? Exactly. Like you for? say, we always, everyone's always seems to get to the side of taken. And yes, they are available and yes, they are significantly cheaper. However, a lot of employers, as I mentioned before, might only do 5,000 miles a year. They might just want, listen, I want an electric vehicle. I just want the cheapest thing to get me from A to B, in which case this scheme is still a massive benefit. That's the great thing about this scheme. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at the performance, higher end vehicles or the small ones. It works for all of them because the BIK is fixed. Mm -hmm. So like you say, the, the common ones, like say Hyundai, um, Kona, for example, Kia, Nero, these are really Vauxhall, Corsa, Electric. These are all really popular ordered cars. And mainly because one, they have got great spec, like you say, the perception, I think people have the perception from brands historically where the spec levels were quite different and the build quality was quite different from some of these brands to the to the premium brands. But what I would say now, and I don't know whether it's just because they've all flipped over to electric, but the build quality, the spec levels of these vehicles are comparable, if we're being honest. Um, sometimes better, like you say, the Kia Nero got a great spec. Um, 
a, a vehicle which has just come to the UK market, BYD. Mm. Um, like most people won't know what they are, but sort of Nissan Qashqai, Kia Nero size vehicle. The spec on them for the price you're paying is phenomenal. And like you say, you're still getting a really good range, um, but it's cheaper. So they're sort of a, a few sort of common vehicles ordered by people who would not say, not say it's less up, but more, like you say, I, I just want an electric vehicle sort of thing. Like you say, the benefit is, Alistair, I'm, I'm giving up a gross element of salary. I'm getting an electric vehicle and it's much cheaper than me doing going my, my current vehicle, which I'm doing personally. And it's got my insurance built in and it doesn't matter if I leave. So I've got all this protection. And it's still costing me less than, than what I'm doing personally. So for them, it's like, well, why, why am I not doing this? Yeah, exactly. If you do want us to do a quote for you, get a price for you, um, why not comment the model of the car you're interested in and we'll get in touch with you and uh, run some prices and see how much it can save you. So that is something for you to do. If you are just joining us, by the way, it's Q&A sal uh, on Salary Sacrifice. We're joined with Mike, our Salary Sacrifice expert. If you have any questions, comment them in the question section just down below. You can see where someone has commented one question down there. We are ready to take your questions live. Uh, if you're watching the recording of this, again, comment your questions and Mike will respond to them uh, in a direct message. So uh, do feel free to ask us any questions. I've got a few more of my own, which I will move on to. Let's talk about the process of setting up the salary sacrifice scheme within a business. Um, if I know it varies depending on the kind of size of the business. Let's talk about a, a business with maybe 200 staff. Yeah. How would you go about setting up the salary sacrifice scheme so, in a business like that? Or if, 200 staff or more? Yeah, not, not a problem. So with a staff size of that, we'd like to build a system. And when I say build a system, it's like a dedicated online portal where your employees, re well, your employees register the portal. All the vehicles which you have agreed from the employees listed on there you can pick the mileage, you can pick the duration of the contract, and the prices are run real time for them. Obviously, subject to the information they put, so the employee will register the home address postcode if you need insurance, gross salary to do the deductions, etc. Um, and it's real time. Now, the reason we build a system um, for staff size that wise is because we want to keep this as streamlined as possible for you. Ultimately, we take on a lot of responsibility. We can do payroll reports, um, we can send these across to your HR to do the deductions. We are the middleman between you, like I say, we like to set ourselves between them because the last thing we want is to set up this scheme and your employees start ringing HR or your fleet, your fleet administrator asking questions about it. When ultimately we, we like to answer the questions and we like to take as much of the burden off your team as possible. Now, obviously the reason we build the system is because all of it, if, if an employee orders a vehicle, all of it is generated off the system. Um, ultimately we can do as much as possible, but we can't deduct your your employee's salary that ultimately falls upon you and your payroll team. Mm -hmm. um, so we like to obviously when it's done through a system, all the things is neatly sort of aligned and we pass it on to your payroll with payroll reporting, et cetera, at the end of the month or the first of the month, whenever you dictate you want it. And it's an easy sort of conversation with your with your employee who's opted into it, obviously informing them that you're going to reduce the gross salary by X amount and yep. then just applying it. And that's probably as much as it gets involved with from HR. And that's how much we like it. The only other one is P11D reporting, obviously the vehicle does attract benefit in kind. Therefore, there does need to be an element of P11D reporting. P11D, for example, is the value of the vehicle. So when you go on a website and you build a vehicle and says the car's 47 grand, yep. that's a P11D value. Um, taxable list price, it's called. And you do have to report this to HMRC. Now, we do provide templates to easily do this. However, there's different ways in which employees do it. Some employees pass it on. So obviously, because it's not actually your responsibility, it's the employees because it's a perk. You can pass responsibility on to the employees to call HMRC and inform them that they've taken this perk in this vehicle. Um, but most most staff members, oh, sorry, most employers tend to just do this in-house and use the templates. Like you say, it has to be done once a year. It's fairly straightforward, but the admin burden can be kept to a minimum. So to implement the system, when I'm that, like I say, we usually like to get the key stakeholders in the room. So that tends to be, obviously, we have the initial conversation. It tends to be directors who push this forward. Mm -hmm. But then we tend to find that it ends up with HR, um, payroll, um, finance. ES, finance, ESG, anyone, if, you, if your company's of the size where ESG is a, a predominant factor, which is obviously various different, but environmental, social and governance. So could be environment reporting, could be social benefits. Mm -hmm. um, these tend to be the key people which you get in the room. Obviously, they've all got questions for different reasons, HR, admin burden, ESG, how can we report? So we like to get these people in the room to show them how, the, how this scheme can benefit or how it's going to impact each sort of area in your company. For that point forward, we agree a scope, so we like to sort of understand 
do you have any particular kind of vehicles you want excluded from the scheme? Do you not want two-door vehicles? Don't want convertibles, for example? What mileage is your employees doing? Um, how long do you want to run the vehicles for? Do you want to cap it at three years? So you can have vehicles for two, three, four years. You picked this up. And then we build the scheme around that. Um, and that's probably the initial route. Once we've sort of agreed the scope, we then build FAQs. Um, the reason we build FAQs is we find sort of an implementation time for a large company. For example, we'd like to quote six to eight weeks. Now, it doesn't actually take six to eight weeks to build. But the reason we like to give it that time, because we like to build driver FAQs, we like to build it in your company language, because we find the uptake's much better when it's built, sort of when it sounds like it's coming from your company and it's not necessarily like this is vehicle consulting. They're going to do salary sacrifice. Go. go and speak to them. Yeah. When it's more sort of like a partnership, it, it, we tend to get more uptake. So those FAQs are for the employees, right? Yeah, they're for the employees. And what we tend to do is want to educate them, ultimately. Um, people, we, we tend to find that we speak to people in HR and finance, and they understand salary sacrifice because they deal with gross deductions mm -hmm. on a day scale. Employees tend not to, so we don't understand that they might never have had a company car before because, obviously, this is an entire employee benefit. It's not a company car. So employees take this vehicle sometimes for the for the partner who might be on the kids so it's not that they've had a company car they might have never had benefit in kind before so we like to sort of educate them first we write the sort of the company faqs we answer the questions on that like say we have sort of a financial side a vehicle side it might be questions such as how do i charge my car it could be as simple as that which sounds obvious but for some people it's never run it it's not and once we've done that then sometimes we run like live q a's look very similar to this where you might want to get your employees to jump in um, ask questions about the scheme and i can answer them mm -hmm. and then once we've done that then we can launch the scheme because then we've educated the employees they understand it and we've done a few potentially working examples for them and they're like right i understand this and now then they see the benefit of it and then when we launch the scheme we find the uptake is much better than okay. certain other um, providers who just sort of have an off-the-shelf system for example where they'll set you up in a week maybe even less give you a login but they leave you to it okay. and then you've got employees looking at it thinking it looks cheap but then so they order a vehicle because it looks cheap they get the wage slip a month later and they go what's this that we failed because it's not we've not educated your employees to understand it in, in the first aspect one one thing that we've mentioned before is the monthly payment that comes out yes depending on which provider you set up your salary sacrifice scheme with it's not necessarily a content monthly payment, no it, it? it's it's i find this one really strange to be honest i mean what i would say with ourselves it doesn't matter whether you've just took the vehicle whether you've had the bolt on of the insurance whether you had the bolt on of the early termination protection the price never changes throughout um the only thing that might change is if you've gone over sort of it's gone if it goes past 2025 and the vik has gone from two percent to three percent that's mm -hmm. the only price but that's not a deduction change that's mm -hmm. just a tax change behind the scenes the physical gross deduction from us every month will be exactly the same so that makes it nice and easy yeah for payroll and that that include yeah exactly easy for payroll and that includes even if your employee has an accident uses their vehicle insurance it's not like a normal insurance where the next year your premium goes up yeah it's fixed if you take a three-year agreement this was your insurance premium at the start even if you have an accident have a claim it's the same in year two year three um like say certain other providers and i I can't really go into it because I don't understand why it does. Yep. But some of them fluctuate. So some of them you start off, it might be an £800 deduction for six months and then it goes to 650 And then yep. at the end, it goes to 820 mm -hmm. And it's changing every month, which is, I find it strange. I don't understand why it does. It makes it really difficult for HR and payroll to implement. But more so, it makes it difficult for your employees because the, the, net, the net salary is going to change every month, which is the last thing. You want you want that to change as little as possible. You want to keep it as consistent as possible so your employee understands it more. Okay. So just as a kind of summary of, of the setting it up and implementing it, we're talking around about six to eight weeks. If you do it, this is through our yeah, bus. Yeah, this is this is for us. And but, probably probably more of a caveat is for this is for larger scale customers. Yeah. So obviously any anyone that's listening to this which is smaller might like say might like say might only be a a five employee company director where you might not need a scheme, in which case, well, you wouldn't need a scheme and we won't want to build one because it's overcomplicating it. You might already understand salary sacrifice. You might say, Mike, I, I know what salary sacrifice is. I just know it's cheaper. I just want an electric car. I know how to deduct it. Mm -hmm. Just I just need the quotes and the pro things provided, in which case, absolutely fine. We can set up a consultation. In theory to that, we could actually progress with an order within the day. Okay. Um, you could have a vehicle in sort of one to two weeks, for example. That's just signing contracts and delivery. Um, this is more for larger scale, just okay. because 
when you're offering out to a larger employee base, we like to make sure that everyone in that in that company is, is educated on it. Okay, so slightly larger businesses, to get an online portal, they can tailor it to have whatever cars Absolutely. listed on Absolutely. it they want or change it so they can have, if they only want 36 month contracts, set it all up yeah. how they want. We create a consultation, uh, we go through a consultation, we set up the FAQs and then go live with it to ensure that high uptake. Correct. For smaller companies, it's a kind of account management thing. Exactly that. It's much quicker. Yeah, it's, it's much, much quicker. Like you say, there's less people to educate. We can explain it one to one. Like you yep. say, the portal takes away some of the burden. Like you say, I mean, I'll, I will speak to all your employees, but obviously if you launch a scheme of 200 employees and everyone's ringing the phone, it becomes a bit more difficult. It lets them get prices and work through it themselves. And then I can just sort of just touch base and call them and help them through it if they need be. And some, some employees don't actually. We find that when we set up, some employees don't even speak to us. Um, it kind of they've didn't they've done slightly sacrifice other companies. They order the vehicle and I just ring them up saying this is what you've ordered. Are you happy with it? The price and yeah, let's proceed it, which is which is great. So like you say, the system's built up to ease an admin burn on our side and and your side. But when it's a small company, it's account management. It's a lot smaller. I've, we've got time to speak to everyone and help them understand it, and it's, it's a much much simpler process. Okay, that's great. Um, if you are just joining us, we're doing a Q&A on salary sacrifice. If you have any questions, comment them in the qu comment section down below. We are going to answer your questions live. We're going to be on for a few more minutes taking your questions. I've got a few more questions listed here. So um, if you want to book a call with Mike, you can do so by scanning this QR code and you can book a uh, time and date and have a one-on-one -on -one chat if you want to get a quote or just some advice that is the route to go down. So uh, let's just talk about, we've say a company has set up the scheme. I want to talk about what happens after it's been set up in terms of, say, employees have queries or questions. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, so what I would say is we, well, with ourselves, we're not sort of just a, we don't just provide a system. We are a fully managed solution. Mm -hmm. um, so when once your employee's got the vehicle, it doesn't just stop there. We touch base with our employees at least every six months, one, to get mileage amendments or mileage capture. So we capture a driver's mileage at the six-month period, at the 12-month period. Say, for example, they took the contract on 10,000 miles per year, but it turns out they're only doing 5,000 miles per year. We'll then ring them up. You, you've, you've took the contract on 10,000 miles a year. You're actually only doing five. Do you anticipate yeah. any changes, for example, in your mileage? No, no, it's, it's going to stay the same in which case we'll rewrite the contract so it then reduces the employee's contribution, in which case saving them even more money. Mm -hmm. um, we do manage them, like say, we pick up the phone, we ask questions, um, we help them throughout it. So if someone calls up, Mike, I've, I've got a, Question a vehicle, I've got a mechanical problem, we yeah. can instruct them in the right way. We Like I say, we are a point of contact for them throughout mm -hmm. the contract. And that even comes right up to the end with the disposal of the vehicle. Hopefully they've run, us, they, they, they've, they've run it for the three-year period or two-year period and they've had a great response from it like I say most people tend to then at the six months before their end reorder a vehicle and then like I say we can even help with the key, key swaps to the collection of the current vehicle and delivery of the new one okay so clue is in the name vehicle consulting Sorting. we do actually consult, consult yeah okay. we, 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 we work throughout the entire process we don't just set you up and and leave you to to look after yourselves we help throughout the process how does that compare to uh well, there's a few different providers. Do they all do that or do they just set it up and leave you to it, some of them? No. So in answer, like I say, some of them are just sort of an out-of-the-box system, which, like I say, some of the systems are very good, but they are just an out-of-the-box and they're sort of a one-size-fits-all. Um, some of them don't do the management after it. Some of them will source you a vehicle and say, well, we've done our job. We sourced your vehicle. That's all we were meant to do. Yeah. You're, you're on your own to do the deductions and everything. We just provided the vehicle. Okay. Um, like I say, they've all got different premises, but ourselves we are we build the system um obviously update all the pricing for you the pricing is updated live and then we help your employees through the order process and beyond as well and that's not just your employees as well that might be used if pay i've got a question i'm saying mike we've we, we set up this this is what we go live we want to alter something slightly or we want to alter a process absolutely it's not like we're no we can't do that we'll help you where we can like say our payroll reports um can be can be also to assist you if need be but obviously, that's just a conversation which you need to have with us. Okay. So just uh, moving on, we've talked about how increasing the uptake amongst your staff is a good thing. Explain to us how, how it is beneficial in terms of CO2 reduction. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in terms of implementing it, it's beneficial for a number of reasons. Like I say there's no point in launching an employee benefit and having no uptake because then what was the sort of the point? Unless you're doing 
sort of a, a ticking exercise just so yeah. listen, we offer it, but we have no intention of actually. Mm. We're doing not bothered. It. We're not, we're not, it's not. not yeah. It's no point in launching employee benefit if you don't get the uptake. Yeah. Now, from your specific point one, obviously, everyone that opts in to an electric vehicle, if they've come out of a petrol or diesel vehicle, for example, um, any business commuting to do so, any business mileage or commuting to work, you can off you can use that CO2 reduction because obviously now they've gone from a petrol and diesel to an electric vehicle, there's no CO2 reduction. You can offset that against your ESG reports or your carbon footprint if you might not be that big. Um, obviously it comes under scope free on SECR reports if you if you do them. Obviously yep. ESG reports are something which every employer has to do. It has to be over a certain size. However, what we are finding is a lot of them a lot of employees are producing ESG reports mainly because it looks great from an outside view on your mm. company. It gives you, gives sort of an investor or someone looking to join your company, um, gives them a really good imprint. Oh, well, they're, they're conscious about the environment. This is what they're doing for the environment side of it. The obviously the uh, social side of it, but they're really looking after their employees. They're showing that they're offering benefits, which which benefit me if I'm looking to join. So, like I say, it's really good. Obviously. The reasons you'd, you'd install it, like I say, if we're going through a number of reasons, obviously you can offset your CO2 footprint. Um, there's NIC savings, although you don't want to, although it's not necessarily profiteering exactly, but you can, there is NIC savings and you can install them into your company how you see fit. It might use it into benefit another benefit, might pass it back to the employee. There's loads of different things in which you can do. Um, can I just stick with that CO2 kind of yeah, uh, reduction area? So, so you can use it to on your ESG report, yes, and the SECR report, yes, under and it's a scope three emission. Yeah, it comes comes in the scope three. Okay, so so if it basically if you've got a business that has high CO2 emissions, you might be under pressure. One of your big KPIs is reducing CO2. This is yeah. well, if it, it's cost neutral for the big business, this is yeah, a definite a, opportunity. A, absolutely. Right? So, giving an example, you might be. A construction company, for example, construction companies tend to have a large fleet of vans. Mm. Obviously, vans tend to do upwards, they do the higher miles, 25, 30,000 miles. It might not be like the center of London or center of town. It might not be viable for you to run electric yeah. vans yet, hopefully in the future, but yeah, it might not be viable. Mm -hmm. In which case, if you have your employee base opting into salary sacrifice, you've got this CO2 outlay of all these diesel or petrol vans mm -hmm. over, the, over the course of the year. Yep. But if you get X amount of people swapped into so sacrificing you switching all them out from petrol and diesel vehicles into full electric. You can use that to offset part of it or, or all of it potentially. You can footprint from your vans, so okay. that's what a lot of employees do use that to offset another part of the company. Like I say, I've picked an example with large vans. You might be a chemical plant, which obviously has got a large CO two output. You can use it to offset a proportion of that. Yeah, I mean, it does appear to be really um, big in construction in particular. So if you are construction business i mean definitely something to consider because of i mean a lot it's, of competitors are making movement into it exactly i mean it, it's big in all sectors but construction it's it's massively in construction it and, and technology firms probably the biggest one um probably for a different reason well yeah. it might not be co2 output but that might be talent attraction yeah um, and retention mm. um like well let's talk about that for for the tech using that tech example where you've got a lot of highly paid yeah. staff um, it's competitive to get staff on board at your business. How can salary sacrifice help attract staff and retain yeah. staff? Exactly. So like you say, obviously technology industries tend to have quite employees which earn sort of higher than average, um, in which case it is a competitive market. So by offering this benefit, um, it's obviously we've touched on it before, it's making your employee's salary go further. So say you've got someone who might be on 50 grand and you offer salary sacrifice, and there's a competitor which is offering, say, 52,000, 53,000, but they don't offer salary sacrifice. So this employee, which has got 50 grand, is in a is in a salary sacrifice vehicle, might be looking, thinking, well, that place is going to pay me more. However, when I do the calculation, obviously, if I leave here, I've got to, I've got to give them hand my car back, and then I've got to source a vehicle myself. So actually, when I do the actual figures, I'm saving this much by taking an electric vehicle with this company where I'm at, and then I've got to go to this company. But the salary increase is going to get eaten up by me sourcing a vehicle anyway, so it might not be beneficial. Yeah. So like I say there's numerous reasons why you do it, but like I say, people looking in, it's a really requested perk from people looking in for, for different reasons. Obviously, we've talked about the, the, the cost savings to them. Um, there's other factors. Obviously, all these leases are done under the business name, so there's no credit checks on a on an employee. Um, they might not want the asset on the credit file mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason. And guys might be remortgaging shortly. They might not have the credit to attain these vehicles so staff members might be looking in thinking 
I'd never be able to get this vehicle any other way. But if I join this company or I'm at this company, it makes these vehicles attainable for me, which is like I say, it's, it's one of the reasons, main reasons you see all these Teslas on the roads and everything, because people think, like I say, Teslas, it's a 50 grand car. It's a lot of money to a lot of people. But when you actually sort of do the figures and sell sack and everything and you look into it, they're actually really well priced. Yeah, exactly. So when you actually compare the comparison, so I'm driving a Tesla or I pick sort of a BMW 3 Series petrol. Yeah, the BMW 3 Series petrol might be 10 grand cheaper to buy, but when I, the fuel costs, what it's going to be worth, the deductions, it just makes so much sense to go to electric. And that's probably one of the more reasons, say, say for, for a technology firm or, or place like where where it's hard to bring in staff and secondly, it's hard to retain staff. Mm. That's probably a reason why you'd look to sort of implement salary sacrifice in a company of that size. Mm -hmm. So it's not obviously not just technology firms. No. Um, industries that have, well, it's particularly beneficial I mean, for staff who are, are highly paid. So in like I mean, finance and, or consulting, for I mean, example, and, it really and works if, well. If, if you ask any, any industry you're in, if you're offering a cost neutral benefit from you as an employer, that's going to retain your staff. It's 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 really a, a no-brainer. Like no say, brainer for anyone. The, the second-hand costs, which we don't even speak about recruitment costs. So it might not be directly attributed to salary sacrifice, but if you've got an employee who's sort of looking to join your company or stay on because of sales sack and because of that benefit, the recruitment costs now can sort of go to sort of four or five grand per person. So the second hand cost that you can make in savings as well are also not to be ignored. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, we are just going to focus on one more area, which is charges and all that kind of area. If you do have any more questions, this is your kind of final call. Comment your questions in the comment section below. If you do have any, if you want us to do any quotes on any cars, comment the model of the car that you want us to uh, find a price uh, for you. Um, let's just crack on with talking about the charges and how that all works. So if a an employee is getting a car, an electric car for the first time, don't necessarily have a charger at their house, when they order it through, if they went with us, if they order it through vehicle consulting, can they order a charger as well? How would that all be set up? Yeah, absolutely. It's something which we do offer. Um, what we do is every, every time someone orders a vehicle, we ask the question anyway. Um, we don't tend to build them directly into our quoting system just because people might already have them installed. And what we don't want to do is charge an employee the cost of a charger if they've already got one installed. That seems pointless, um, which other providers do regardless. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, any, any order, we'll ask the employee, did he have a charger or are they interested in installing a charger? If they are, what we'll do is we'll send them a link. We'll get a few details from them. It tends to be just where they're based, where, they're, where they want the charger, where the fuse box is, and then we can get a price across to them. Mm -hmm. um, now, depending on circumstances with you completely sometimes we can build it in uh, most of the time we do it as a separate cost um, for various reasons but we, it is something which we can have a conversation about from the employee if it's something you want to do but uh, in answer to your question simply yes we can help with installing a charger so you mentioned that some of the providers just do it like at a flat rate yeah so uh, that's basically if if you've got a dead easily, it does easy install. You've paid for all the difficult uh, installs. Exactly. Else. The, the problem is with building a cost in, and like say you, you see on all of these free charger with every contract supplied, nothing, nothing is free. Obviously, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, they, they take an average. So, for example, an average install might be sort of six to eight hundred pound, mm -hmm. but a difficult install might be. Mm -hmm. 1500 if they're trying to run it from a garage all the way down the road to the to the fuse box yeah um so what these companies do is they, they sort of go into the middle ground so they fall in like the thousand pound a month built into the contract on a three-year contract yep. give or take 30 35 pound a month mm -hmm. um and we take the average so yes for every simple install so every 600 to 800 pound install you're paying over the odds for it but then one difficult install offsets the cost that so he just builds sort of an average to do to sort of cover everything. Okay. So um, if you are getting your first salary sacrifice, first electric car, you want your charger installed at your house, there's a pretty decent chance that the savings that you're making in your first year with the salary sacrifice oh, I, 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 pays I, I, for the charger. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're coming from a company car before or the savings you're making, it will absolutely offset the cost of the charger. And like you say, it's not just... I mean, if you, if you future proof in your house, um, and it does actually add value to your house as well. So it's not, obviously, you're doing it to satisfy that, but it's not dead money. It's it's increasing the value of your house as well. So when you come to sell, 
it's already got an electric charger fitted, mm -hmm. which therefore adds adds a slight bit of value to your house. So it might offset the cost anyway. Okay. And what about uh, installing charges at a business premises? Absolutely the same. It's something we can absolutely do. Probably a little bit more detail into it um, because obviously commercial properties don't tend to just install one charger. Yep. It tends to be a certain amount depending on company size. So what we'd do is obviously we'd, we'd come out with, we'd, we'd send you the link, ask a bit of detail about yourself. What we'd probably do in the first case is do a site survey just to understand sort of how many vehicles, or sorry, how many charges you want to install where you want to install them, is it a difficult install? And then what we tend to do is if you're looking to build, sort of like I say, say you're a larger company, you might not want to install 10 charges at once because mm -hmm. you might not, you don't know what needs you're gonna have, you don't know what uptake you're gonna have in people charging there. Mm -hmm. um, you might only want five in the, in, in the first aspect, in which case we'd build all the infrastructure to have 10 okay. in the first place. So then you have your five, you pay for your five, and then when you decide maybe 12 months down the line, right, we're getting a lot of take, mm -hmm. now we need to install some more okay. charges, you're not then digging all the ground back up to put in another five. It's just an extension of your five. Okay. And that's probably where it differs with a commercial property. But like you say, okay. there's various, it probably gets a bit more, a bit more difficult with commercial properties because we can structure it in a way where you could open, you potentially, depending on where you're, you're based, you could actually open your charges out to the public on the weekend. So you could actually start recouping costs from a commercial point of view. But that's yeah. probably a conversation. Okay. Have. But the, the key thing is that what we do is, is quite flexible to meet the company we're consulting uh, for, meet uh, their needs. Absolutely, right? like I say it's in the name. We are we are a terrible system. Okay. Everything about us is terrible. Like I say, we want to make it. This can be really easy to sell, but we want to make it the easiest it can be for you as an employer to sell. So if you've got certain quirks or certain questions which you need to answer, or certain things the system needs to be, we can make it be that way. Mm -hmm. And like you say, I mean, it might not be groundbreaking, but it may, if it makes life slightly easier for you, yeah. We want to build it for you yeah, definitely. ultimately okay right well thank you much mike we will leave it thank there you. for today we are going to be live again at three o'clock this afternoon uh talking about the same thing but for ceos um if you want to book a call with mike scan this qr code here you can book a call or if you just want to learn more follow mike uh, his name is mike cottrell c-o-t-t-r-i-double-l -T -T -L on uh on linkedin <laughs> did i get that right you, got, you did get it oh, right thank god okay so if you do want to follow mike and learn more drop him a follow if you want to uh send mike a message drop him a connection request if you have any questions please do continue to uh comment them in the comment section below but we'll leave it there and uh we hope you all have a great day thank you very, very much. much thank you